Thank you for that introduction. Um, I have to say, I don't know where Russ is in the room, but um, I will comment that even as an extrovert standing in front of 200 people, a little bit intimidating. Um, so bear with me. Um, I'm used to doing this in quite smaller venues because user experience generally is kind of a side topic at agile conferences, and then at agile conferences, UX is a bit of a side topic. So um, it's quite exciting to be sort of in the main stage today. Um, so what I'm going to do is, much like many other speakers today, I'm going to make you stand up. So. If you think you are good at your job, stand up. OK. If you think you're good at any part of your job, stand up. <laughs> OK. Mo most people are standing. I I'm a little bit worried about the ones who aren't, because hopefully there's something at your job that you're good at. But you know, we, we can address that after the session. Um, so the next, the next question I have for you. If you think that being an expert and having the knowledge that you have right now is enough to continue to be good at your job, stay standing. Sorry, did I make that confusing? OK. So this is interesting. So most people think that with the knowledge, the rest of you can sit down. Sorry. <laughs> um, this is interesting. So most people, oops, most people in the room think that the knowledge that they have today and the expertise that they have is not enough to do their job well in the future. So I'm going to confess something to you. I'm fairly good at my job. I've been doing it for a number of years, and I'm not going to tell you how many years I've been doing it, but it's a number of years that I've been doing my job, and I'm pretty good at it. I've designed airplane cockpits, I've designed healthcare software, I've designed software to run nuclear power plants, I am Designing life and death software, I've been there, done that, and I'm actually, as far as I know, no one's died because of anything that I've built. So I'd like to think that I'm fairly good at my job. But my confession is that that's not enough. That's not enough for me to actually go into my work every day and do what I do, because what, I'm, what I do is about the customers that we have at my company and making the world a better place for the people who use the software that I build or that I design. And being an expert and the knowledge that I have right now and today is not enough for me to do that. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Luckily for me, lots of the other speakers so far have brushed over some of, not brushed over, have mentioned some of these topics already. So there should be a bit of familiarity with some of what we've talked about. I'm pointing the wrong way because it's backwards for me. Um, so just quick introduction. I'm Darcy. That's my Twitter ID. Um, that kind of looks like a sock. It's meant to look like California, which is where I'm from originally. Um, the reason I mention that is because I get very excited about what I do and sharing knowledge with other people and trying to understand their experiences so that I can improve what I do. Um, but being from California, I often get quite excited and that means I can talk really fast. So if I am talking too fast, put two hands in the air and I'll slow down for you. This is the only slide that's not hand-drawn. You can tell that I'm not actually a visual designer, I'm a user experience designer. Um, but one thing that I'm not going to do, I'm not going to sell snake oil today. I'm not going to give you a solution that suddenly makes your life better. I'm not going to tell you how to do anything differently. I'm going to offer you some options, and I'm going to tell you how changing my point of view and my mindset made my life at work better. So it's not snake oil, it's my personal story and my experiences, and hopefully someone in the audience will recognize something in here and be able to make their life and their work a little bit better because of my experiences. In other words, hopefully you can avoid making the mistakes that I've made. The premise of what I'm going to talk about is that experimentation and testing, that's a little test tube in case you couldn't tell from my drawings, um, is better than expertise on its own. The combination together is even better, but being an expert by itself is not enough to be good at our jobs. I'm going to talk a lot about user experience because that's what I know. However, most of this applies to anything that we do. Simply being an expert is not enough if you can actually test it and experiment. So some of this fits into what um, Martin was saying earlier around learning isn't very useful until you put it into practice. Being an expert isn't very useful until you can prove it in an experiment or a test. Ah, oh, too many. Okay, so 
Um, what do I mean by experimentation? So my view as a user experience designer of experimentation includes all of these different types of testing. So there's A-B testing, interviewing customers, usability, formal usability testing, informal guerrilla testing, unmoderated testing, testing paper prototypes, the lean concept of get out of the building. So it's talking to people, it's understanding what they need and what they do. The world that I designed software for five years ago isn't the same world that I design for today. And if I stick with what I know and stick to the same things that I have always tried and always done, I'm not going to be very good at my job and I'm not going to be able to address the needs of the customers who I build software for. So I talk about all of the testing. One of the things that we do at my company and that I've done at a couple of other companies as well is we've implemented something called Five on Friday which means that every Friday, rain or shine, we have five customers come into our office to do some testing for us. We don't always know what we're going to test. We don't always have something to test, but we always have a valuable conversation with them. When they come in, sometimes we test live software. Sometimes we test our competitors' software. Sometimes we test paper prototypes. Sometimes we put sketches in front of them that were drawn 10 minutes before they turned up in the office. And sometimes we sit down with them and we have a conversation to say, what is it that you need? What gap are we not filling right now? And all of that provides us with valuable information that we would never have gotten if we hadn't been talking to people. And by making it a ritual that it's an expected part of every week, every Friday, five people come in, it's really started to become a part of the development cycle. So the developers and the QA and the product owner and the business analyst look forward to having these sessions because they know they're going to learn something that, we're, that is valuable to what we're doing. Maybe it changes our roadmap. Maybe it just simply validates what we already have. Maybe it raises questions that we need to do further research into. But either way, we end up with additional information that we didn't have. Not everyone can do five on Friday type testing, but if it's something that you can fit into your schedule, it's a really valuable tool because it involves everyone on the team in that testing. And it's not just a user experience designer going off and coming back with, I've done research and here's the answer, because that's not very helpful to anyone else on the team. Most, about, most of the reason that I quite like Agile is that it's about collaboration and it's about the team together. And if I, as a designer, have to go off into a dark room or run away into a laboratory and, and do some testing and come back, it's a lonely experience for me and I don't get to involve the rest of my team. So using, um, using approaches like guerrilla testing or the five on Friday, it means you can involve the entire team. And hopefully, since I'm guessing most of you aren't designers, that actually sounds like something you'd want to do. You'd want to see real people using the software that you build. It's often too easy to sit in a room with your computer and write code with your team and it's agile and we've got stuff on the walls and it's exciting and we forget the people who are actually at the other end of the system and they have to use this. And sometimes it's, they, it's a system that they want to use Sometimes it's a system that they have to use, and sometimes it's a system that is life or death, that causes a life or death situation for them if it has to do with healthcare, if it has to do with transportation, if it has to do with lots of things. So actually sitting in a room and never seeing customers means that you're missing information that you could have that would make you better at your job because you'd be able to empathize with what these people do. I'm pointing it the right way. So. <laughs> You can tell I'm not a visual designer. This is a hippopotamus. <laughs> um, one of the reasons that I think this culture of experimentation is important um, is because it helps you fight the hippo. How many people have heard of hippo? OK, not very many. So I'll explain this to you because it's easy. Um, hippo stands for highest paid person's opinion. And often, trying to fight a hippo, especially a stampeding hippo, isn't really something you want to do. But the same thing is true if you're in a meeting and the CEO says, I think it should be blue. It's an opinion. It's coming from someone who's highly paid, well-respected, but probably not qualified to be making that decision or that recommendation. So using an experimentation culture gives you a gives everyone a method for fighting the hippo. We're not even fighting the hippo. It's more about befriending the hippo. So I'll tell you a story that happened to me a couple of weeks ago. Someone in our company, we'll call him Dave, totally not his real name. Dave came to me and said, Darcy, 
I want to try this thing. I've seen it on, on a similar site to ours. It's not a competitor, but it's something that I think is really valuable. I want you to do this for me now. And I, you know, in my head, I'm thinking, well, we've already kind of got the, you know, a pretty solid roadmap for the next few months, and, and we don't have extra time to be doing this stuff. And, and you know, actually, this part of the, the website, it already works really well. We've tested it. It's one of our highest converting products. Why do we want to change this? And instead, what I did in that moment was I swallowed that thought, and I said, that's really interesting. Tell me more. Tell me what it is that you want to see and how you think this is going to benefit our customers and our company. And I sat down with him, and he's not a designer, and he knows he's not a designer, and he, doesn't want to, he didn't want to do the designs. He wanted to see someone in the company turn his idea into reality. And I sat down with him, and I got the information from him, and I took it away to my team. I have a team of seven designers that I work with. And we sat down and, and we worked out some ways to, you know, some options for what we could do with this design. And we made some changes to it, but it was still fairly true to his original idea. And because we also have web developers on my team, we kind of, I, I schemed a little bit and snuck it in. And it wasn't really in the roadmap, but, you know, he was kind of important in the company, so we snuck it in. And we got it done and we put it live for an A-B test and it doubled the conversion of that particular product. And now I could, have, I could have taken that as a bit of a, you know, a bit of a problem, that it wasn't my idea, and as the sole user experience designer at my company, I should be the one creating the wireframes, and I should be the one deciding the user journey. And instead, I thought of it as it was a win-win situation. He got his idea live, we sold more of that particular product, which is quite important to us, because it's one of our um, most popular, and I befriended the hippo. So the next time that Dave, who's really not a hippo, but you know, it, it's a good point, the next time Dave has an idea, he feels comfortable coming to me because he knows that I will support him when and how I can. It also means that I don't have the sole pressure of being the only person who can do this design work and come up with these ideas. So I now have a source of 400 people in my company who can come up with ideas, and we can test them, we can put them into place, under certain restrictions, because we do need to A-B test or you know, validate that things aren't going to break the site. But I have a wealth of information and ideas that I didn't have before, and it's because no one had actually tried to make friends with the hippo. They'd fought the hippo, and you almost always lose when you fight with a hippo, as you can imagine. Although that one looks quite cute, most of them don't look quite so friendly. I won't make you stand up for this one, I'll just ask a question. How many people at work often feel pressured to always have the right answer. Okay, that's actually pretty comforting. I've asked this question before and gotten a lot, um, a lot more people who said yes. One of the things about testing and experimentation is it means that I don't have to be right all of the time. I don't have to have the one right answer. I can fail, I can be wrong, I can come in and say, actually, I don't know what the right answer is, but here are some options. Let's try both of them and see what happens. So it takes a lot of the pressure off to be right all of the time. And obviously, you know, most of us will work in agile environments, and so we believe in failing fast and learning from our mistakes. The reality that I've experienced, though, is a lot of companies really struggle with that point, especially if you're working in something, in a situation where making a mistake can cost the company money. So as much as every, everyone kind of says, yes, yes, fail fast, learn from the mistakes, it's okay not to be right, for me, taking an approach of experimentation more than expertise has taken the personal pressure off of me, and I don't feel like I have to have the right answer on the, t on the tip of my tongue every time someone asks me a question. It gives me the opportunity to test things, to learn things, to try new things, and to sometimes actually say, I don't know, let's try a few things and find what works best. And for me personally, as a bit of a perfectionist, that has massively improved my work um, situation, and all I did was change my mind about how I did things and how I approached design. Has anyone ever heard of hero design? 
A few people. OK, so what hero design is, it's something that's fairly common in the UX and design community. It's one designer going off into a dark room, running away, working their magic. No one knows what they do in that room, right? And they come out, and they have the answer. And it's like, you know, the Ten Commandments. You come off the mountain, and they're inscribed in stone, and that's what you're set with. And hero design often is the idea of one person in isolation, away from their team, without all of the information and without all of the options that are available to them and without all of the expertise and experience of the rest of their team. A culture of experimentation and testing means that you, don't, you can get rid of the hero designer and you make design a team sport. When I sat down with Dave, the hippo, I wasn't designing on my own. I was contributing my experience, but so was he, and so were other members of the team. And so what we were able to do is rather than having the hero designer who runs out and says, I have the answer, you work on the answer together. And for me, one of the reasons that I really dislike hero design is to me it feels a lot like going backwards into the waterfall world. Someone goes off in a room with the requirements, and they do their work, and they come out, and this is the answer, and they throw it at a development team, and they're off to work on another project because they're, they're the superhero, and they're trying to solve all of the problems. And that's not very motivating for them. It's not very motivating for the team that they're working with. And it's, to be fair, a fairly lonely existence for a user experience designer to do that. And if you think about user experience design, most of it is about understanding people and trying to work with people and know how to make software better for them. So being isolated from their team is actually not very useful for them and can cause real problems for the people, for the designers, because they are then isolated and working in a vacuum. And that goes against most of what Agile claims to be about and what I truly believe it is about. So I recently found this quote. Um, oh, that, that picture is a little bit blurry. Sorry. Um, Best practices are someone else's solutions to their problems, not necessarily the right solution to ours. And that's from the Pop and Dicks in their, um, their lean book. So the thing I like about this is often in user experience design and many other fields that I've worked with, there is considered to be a best practice that people should follow. That best practice is often someone else telling you how to do your job and what you should do. In my many years of working in software and working in design, I have never solved the same problem twice. It might be a similar problem. It might be design a login. How complicated can a login be? It's always a different audience, a different year, which means there are different devices available. There are different expectations from our customers. The requirements for login are different. Some logins can be, you know, not super secure. Some logins need to be incredibly secure because it's sensitive data that they're protecting. I've never solved the same problem twice. So this idea that there are best practices that we can rely on to give us the answer is troubling to me simply because that best, that best practice was a solution to a different problem from someone else. Now maybe it gives a starting point. Maybe it's a useful place to begin from and then do testing on how does that apply to your own situation. But actually, in and of itself, a best practice probably doesn't get you the answer for your specific situation that you are trying to solve. So relying on, on best practices within design and other fields is quite dangerous. But a culture of experimentation and testing where everything you do is tested, everything you do is validated or verified, you can actually start to learn what the best practice, best practice is for your own situation and understand where that may change in the next situation that you find yourself in. So, we're nearly done. I'm going to leave you today with two challenges. The first challenge is to adopt the phrase, let's try that. Rather than saying no when someone gives you a daft idea, try it. Talk to them. Even if you don't end up implementing it, have the conversation with them because some, making someone in your company feel heard and feel valued will go a long way to making your life easier and making things better for your team. So adopt the phrase, let's try that. And after you've said, let's try that, test it. Don't just build it and assume that it's right. Test it and compare it to what you already have so that you've learned something new from that situation and possibly befriended a hippo while you're at it. The second challenge 
Use your expertise, but test and learn every single day. So this is about not getting stuck in a rut, not relying on the information and knowledge that you currently have, because that information and knowledge becomes outdated incredibly quickly in a fast-moving world. So test what you do, whether it's user experience, whether it's process with your, with your team, whether it's a new architecture, whether it's a new way of doing QA. It doesn't matter what it is. Try something new. And I have to say, after spending a day and a half here at ACE, my brain is bursting with ideas for what to do. And I'm not actually sure which one I want to try first and how I'm going to take this back to my team. I haven't worked that out yet. But what I do know that I want to do is take these ideas that I've learned and listening to Martin around learning isn't real until you put it into practice. Take the things that you've learned, that you've heard over the last couple of days, test them and learn something from it and then share that with your team. I would believe that any team in this in this room where there are people here could benefit if the team made a mission to learn something new about their customers every single day. We could improve our software, we could improve our teams, and by then, by doing all of those, we could make our personal world better than it is today. Thank you, that's it. <laughs>